thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Christina Nitsilova and I am the Urban Development Officer at Community Land Scotland. Um, and Kerry, if you can move to the next slide, I will talk a bit more about who we are. There we go. So Community Land Scotland was set up um, about 10 years ago uh, by the first wave of community landowners, um, the likes of the Isle of Egg, uh, Gia and the Western Isles. And since then, um, we have obviously a lot more communities buying land and assets. So we're now a membership organization of more than 90 communities. And Community Land Scotland is the representative body of Scotland's community landowners. Uh, so what we focus on is influencing policies. So working uh, basically on land reform and making sure that community land ownership is considered and supported through that. We also work to promote uh, community land ownership as a model for sustainable development. Um, and we do that through mainly events. And we also facilitate a lot of knowledge exchange between our members. So the more established organizations uh, supporting the kind of the newer aspiring communities. And what we mean by community landowner um, or community land ownership as a model. So uh, what we mean by that is, um, so community is, um, we define as a geographic community. So it can be a small rural, rural area, or it could be a neighborhood in the city. And um, it's a not profit distributing uh, organization. Uh, that has open membership for anyone living um, in this chosen geographic area. Um, so they become members of the organization and that allows for kind of a democratic decision-making process and democratic form of ownership of the land and asset that is in the ownership of this community body. Kerry, could you go to the next slide? Uh, a bit of a whistle stop tour of <laughs> land reform uh, here. Um, so land reform is a work in progress. Um, it's uh, trying to address uh, the current uh, unequal patterns of land ownership in Scotland. Unfortunately, we're one of the few, we're one of the countries with the most uh, unequal uh, land ownership pattern in the world. Uh, and here you can see um, that 16 uh, landowners hold 10% of uh, the land in Scotland. Uh, we also have other issues that need modernized. Um, so although we kind of scoring quite low in terms of some, some things to do with land ownership, we're also kind of leading in, uh, in many ways in terms of our land reform approach. So uh, land reform is seen as crucial to creating a more socially just country. Um, so um, here, the key developments that I've listed, I'll just touch on a few of them. So, so for the last 10, 20 years, we've had the Scottish Land Fund, which basically enables community buyouts. This is a 10 million pounds per year budget. Um, and it is um, distributed by the Scottish government. Um, and then we have had numerous land reform acts and uh, community empowerment act which through their interaction have created different routes to community ownership, such as uh, asset transfer of a publicly owned land and asset uh, or community right to buy, which has numerous iterations, but is basically a, a route, a legal route for communities to seek ownership of land and assets that are important to their development. Um, and uh, since the 2016 Land Reform Act, we also have seen the establishment of Scottish Land Commission, who are uh, basically advising Scottish government on kind of policy approaches and new changes that will um, enable kind of our ambitious ambitions on land reform in the country. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please, Kerry? So um, community ownership. Um, has been around as for a while actually for some of the first community bios happened in the early 20th century but it wasn't until the late 90s that their kind of the movement started there was a, a wave almost of community buyouts so the isle of egg a brier a brier forest uh, in inverness 
and a number of other ones um, that um, basically bought the land and started developing to meet their community's needs and basically demonstrated that this is a, a, a really uh, impactful um, way to regeneration and development. Um, so since then, uh, we have seen a lot um, of groups buying land to um, you know, uh, support the economic development of their area, but whether building uh, business um, units, whether be building new housing, developing renewables, um, um, so that's been mostly in the urban areas, and sorry, in the rural areas uh, for the last 20 odd years. But um, in the last four years, we've, uh, since there's been new legislation to allow urban communities to benefit from um, basically the land reform movement, um, we've seen more and more urban groups uh, seeking ownership of land and assets um, to meet the, their local needs. So some of the more famous ones are Kinning Park Complex in Glasgow, who um, after a long history of community activism managed to acquire uh, their community center and are now redeveloping it. Um, we have Action Party in Edinburgh and Bridge and Farmhouse and a number of others that Carrie will talk about. But basically what we're seeing is the urban groups are starting to follow in the steps of the rural communities and basically starting to demonstrate how community ownership can have quite a transformational impact on local areas. Um, so could you go to the next slide, please, Kerry? Um, so though we, we, we can see kind of from community land scholarly perspective how there can be quite a, a you know, big transformational impact and some groups are working really hard to prove that there are quite a, a few challenges in the way for community ownership in urban context. And uh, we actually in the last two years have been doing some research and gathering some evidence and we identified 17 <laughs> uh, challenges, but I have selected a few of them um, to highlight here. So um, some of it is all around awareness amongst kind of decision makers around community powers and community rights in relation to land in the urban context. There are gap, gaps in the support um, system for communities who want to acquire land and assets, which is a really difficult process. Um, and yes, and may, one of the other main challenges um, is basically lacking confidence in what urban communities can achieve. And I would say specifically areas that are maybe in more deprived, uh, in the more deprived section. So, um, yeah, some good food for thought here, I hope. And I'll hand over to Kerry um, for the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Can everyone hear me? Or so if you can hear me, nod, Christina. Does it sound all right? Yeah. Yeah, good. OK. Um, I'll, I'll pick up the thread from Christina of the presentation. But in many ways, that's a good introduction to my role, because what I'm doing um, at Community Land Scotland is, is picking up the thread of Christina's work. She's the urban development officer across all of Scotland, and her work has led to a need, um, identified a need to invest um, in a place-based way, resources and efforts um, to facilitate a step change in community ownership in urban areas. And as part of that, they've identified um, that they would like to set up, the Community Land Scotland is going to set up a um, community ownership hub in Glasgow in the Clyde Valley, so widely defined. And that is my role is, is setting that up at the minute. Um, we're looking at a launch next year. And I'll explain a little bit more about the hub at the end of the presentation, um, but just picking up here um, in the middle. So just to dig in a little bit to unequal experiences by disadvantaged groups. There's, there's a quote here from one of our, our members anonymously and a, and a picture of Kidding Park. That's not a quote from Kidding Park in case you're wondering. Um, and I just wanted to say that in, in our experience um, and that of recent research around different aspects of, of the land reform processes is that there are, um, are unjustified perceptions about aspiring community landowners, about their skills and capacity, particularly in designated areas. Um, so those of us working in the built environment, that's part of, of our work and, and where we are situated. So I think it's important to understand that the evidence is, is pointing to some unequal experiences um, for groups as they, as they attempt to take ownership. Um, and in our experience, uh, Community Land Scotland's lots of good evidence on, you know, those in less advantaged areas often um, create the most creative solutions to their problems because they have to be dedicated and determined. Um, if they're not, you know, it's unlikely other people will step in. 
um, and and their proven expertise in in um, solving the, the, the wide ranging problems that, that come up um, was well documented during the, the, the first, I should say, I was gonna say the COVID crisis, the first lockdown, the initial part of the COVID crisis, um, Community Land Scotland published a, a, a report on this over the summer about all the work that various members were doing um, in their local communities, which was then picked up and put in the Scottish program for government. Um, and these are, these are strong active groups um, responding to COVID, the challenges of COVID shutdown in so many different ways, you know, in, in rural areas, this could be um, publishing a written newspaper so that, you know, elderly residents um, who are isolating in their house could have access to news and in urban areas that might mean engaging um, in a different way with, you know, diverse populations who are working long night shifts as, as key workers. Um, and our members are on the ground doing that work as well as facilitating food banks. A, a great number of them have, have been working hard on food banks over recent months. Um, so, so community ownership is, is a matter of, of opportunities. Christina was talking about challenges and, and there's also lots of opportunities. Um, community owners are skilled and resilient in our experience and that skill is gonna continue to be invaluable in addressing challenges as COVID-19 develops and, and Brexit as well um, and climate change and all of the other points that as designers and urbanists are, are thinking about, um, you know, community ownership plays a, a key role in there. Um, there you know, our experience of community ownerships is their creative approaches. This is a, some slides here of um, the Mid Steeple Quarter project to Dumfries and Galloway, um, which are their separate presentations. There was an RTPI presentation on that recently, which you can probably get off their website. Um, and that was, you know, artist-led regeneration consultation um, leading to, to town center regeneration of, I think it's eight plots um, in the center of the town. Um, it's a great example of how putting land and assets in local control and diversifying land ownership can provide solutions to, to lots of different um, problems. In this case, it was vacant high streets, um, but there's, there's many other problems that, that communities are well placed to address. Um, here's another example um, just to pick up. This is View Park in North Lanarkshire. Um, they, are, over the summer of, of 2020, um, they were the biggest urban lands buyout in scale, 171 acres. They're on the edge of, of Glasgow and North Lanarkshire um, in the Greenbelt, I believe. And they became involved um, in 2004, reactively opposing expansion of, of Strathclyde Business Park. Um, and then 16 years later, they've taken ownership of what they call the Glen. Um, and it, it's a beautiful green space next to the M8 motorway. Um, and this is their strategic plan for how they want to develop that space going forward. Um, so then turning to the community ownership hub. So what Community Land Scotland is doing is, is um, setting up a community ownership hub in Glasgow and the Clyde Valley widely defined. And, and the idea is it's a place-based place investment of resources to facilitate a step change in community ownership. So Christina's great work and, and the other colleagues at Community Land Scotland really looking into the, the challenges around how community ownership is being uptaken in urban areas, um, you know, identified a number of recommendations and this is one of them. So moving forward on that is, is an exciting thing to be doing. Um, we're gonna launch it in early next year. So we're a soft launch now and part of my role is, is spreading the word and the profile of this. Um, its focus is Clyde Valley widely defined um, and we're targeting three local authorities within that, which is which is Glasgow, North Lanarkshire, and Inverclyde. Um, but Community Land Scotland you know, would never turn away a group if they wanted to be involved. But what we're doing is targeting those particular areas to really um, raise the profile of community ownership as an option. Um, the hub is a, is a single gateway for community ownership. Um, so if you work in community ownership, you'll know there's lots of, of people doing really amazing work in different parts of community ownership. Um, and what the hub wants to do is, is be a single point of contact um, for people to come and signpost to great existing services as well also plug some gaps in terms of services and other things for aspiring community owners. Um, and it's gonna be oriented at communities, but also at policymakers and at the private sector. Um, I come from a private sector background. I think that there's real potential for bringing in community ownership as, as active and, and equal participants in development going forward. So one of the things we want the hub to do is, is very much be welcoming. Um, to everyone who's involved in, in property development. Um, and the, the, the theory behind the hub is that it's an action research project. Um, it's led by the members of Community Land Scotland and, and an advisory panel, which 
as representatives across many um, areas of expertise. Um, so what the hub does is, is it works at a strategic level to open up opportunities. And this is about changing conditions that community owners operate in. Um, it's about, you know, lack of um, sort of lack of perce perceptions about community ownership. It's about changing those. It's about um, when, you know, community owners are, are asking for help from any kind of officer or various expertise that they need along the way that, that people are well aware of community ownership and are ready to help because they understand sort of the wider perspective in which community owners are operating, uh, many of whom are volunteers. So they have a sort of an inherent power and balance between themselves and well-funded developers, just in terms of the technical expertise they would have at their fingertips. Um, and we're also working on changing policies as well as attitudes. Um, I was really pleased to see that the uh, North, oh, I'm going to get exact name wrong now, the North Blasco strategic plan, um, planning document that was published recently um, had a reference to land reform and community ownership in it, which is, which is great going forward because the, the Glasgow local plan doesn't, but of course that's because when it was written, because any local plan documents that would be putting forward before 2016 wouldn't have engaged in this. So as, as designers and planners, we're picking up these threads as we go forward and, and implementing them. Um, within our policy work. Um, and then we're working directly with groups, of course. So um, we want to provide better access to expertise and we're going to plug some of the gaps um, in terms of where the ac access to expertise is right now. We're going to set up a consultant framework, identifying consultants who um, can do things um, that community groups need um, across the wide spread of, of what it is that they do um, and also facilitate a peer-to-peer -peer network for community owners. One thing that Community Land Scotland is really great at doing is connecting community groups so that they can learn from the experiences of others and, and be inspired. Um, and we want to build on that in, in urban areas and that's the hub as well. Last uh, slide. Last um, so yeah. I wanted to end on the, yeah, last one. I wanted to end on, on the, the theoretical point. So hopefully it's a bit inspirational um, and, and sort of go back to land reform. Which is, which is where we, we started. I mean, ultimately community ownership is about how we understand people and land. Um, land reform is creating a new system of land rights in Scotland. It's world leading, it's, it's unique. It's quite exciting if you start thinking about it. Um, and in this system, it's where communities have increased power because they can, they can own land and, and even compulsory purchase it in the interest of sustainable development where there's harm, for example, and that's the most recent um, community right to buy. Um, it's about ideas of landowners as caretakers with rights and responsibilities. Um, and this is the idea of caretaking land, not just unsustainable extraction, um, which you know economists will be interested in. Um, socially just land ownership is a key principle of circular economies, community wealth building, inclusive and sustainable development. Um, and it's for everyone everywhere. So it's about creating a, a change, uh, a new system of property development ultimately with diversified land ownership. And it's a means to an end. It's not developing community ownership for community ownership. It's developing community ownership so that we can deliver all of the other policy priorities we have. Um, and if you want to know more, Christine and I will be um, presenting with, with our colleagues at Planning Advice Service um, on introduction to community ownership for planners in November. I'll just go ahead and stop sharing and we'll invite questions. Yeah, great. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for that. It was a bit of a whistle stop tour, um, but as mentioned at the end, there's the event coming up on the 12th and people are welcome um, to sign up for that if they're interested. Um, I wondered, I mean, sort of, it was, what was really interesting there was kind of the switch from like historically looking at rural communities and areas and the examples of the islands. And then sort of how in the last four years or so, um, there's, you know, the, there's been a rise of urban um, community land ownership happening. Um, is it is it often linked to buildings in that case? What's been your experience um, with that? Like, do, do, can a building act as more of a catalyst? Like, how's yeah? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So um, it's interesting because um, at the moment, I guess we're seeing the first wave of urban community land ownership. And I would say a lot of the groups are either looking to take ownership of premises that they operate mm -hmm. out of, such as such as Kinning Park Complex, and we have a lot of other building ex buildings examples, but also um, to protect green space um, from or, or basically to respond to the loss of potential loss of green space due to mm -hmm. development. Uh, and obviously now with coronavirus and the importance of access 
to such spaces is, I think we'll, we'll see a lot more interest in, in that. And green space could be um, woodlands and it could be, you know, more park, park style <laughs> areas. I don't know how to speak about green space. I know that's Rachel's expertise. <laughs> um, but um, yes, yeah, so at the moment that is, what we're seeing, and also in towns, I think town center regeneration, um, a really interesting example with Miss Tipo Quarter, but we also have Peebles Development Tr Community Trust as well in the south um, and Huntley in the north. So I think these are maybe the, the, the yeah, the key themes so far. I would just add to that, what's exciting about it um, from my perspective is ultimately what is developed is what the community wants. There's, there's, you know, democratic mechanisms built into these processes. So the solutions are as varied as the locations. And there's some great examples, particularly in rural areas where it's more advanced of, you know, spaceport. There's lots of renewable energy success stories as well. Great. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Like each thing will be linked into the community. And that's, um, yeah, that's the interesting bit of it as well, isn't it? Um, and interesting, you mentioned sort of linking it into energy and other uses as well. Um, Sean, you've got a question. Do you want to come in with? Yeah, that was um, great, guys. Thank you, Justina and Carrie. Nice to meet you, Carrie, virtually. I know we've had a few chats on them um, on Twitter a few weeks ago. Uh, that was interesting. Um, and I did I put a question in the chat box just when um, you were presenting because it was in relation to the, the View Park uh, example and about how it took so long, I think it was 16 years, she said. And I just wondered whether uh, that process has been speeded up now, like if we were going to go through the process now, hopefully it wouldn't take 16 years <laughs> anymore. I know these things are very complicated though, um, so I suppose there's every potential, but I just wondered whether there was legislation and, and things put in place since then that might help speed up that process. Um, and I just had a, another point that I was about to write, which is um, about our open space strategy in Glasgow. I don't know whether you guys have an opportunity to engage with the development of the strategy over the last few years. Maybe you haven't, um, but I think there's a lot of overlap, uh, particularly with the, the hub in Glasgow. And I think maybe we could have a chat offline, perhaps, Carrie, um, about that, where we've got some common objectives. Um, uh, that'd, be, that'd be quite interesting at that point. Um, will I will I take the question about view part, Carrie? <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, the 16 years, I think, was from the first moment of the group uh, basically trying to stop the loss of the green space. Um, so the uh, the expansion of the Strathclyde Industrial Park was, I think, basically for a long time it was in the making that more and more of this green space would be lost to that industrial development. Um, so actually it was just a community campaign to try and stop this was the majority of time for that 16 years. Um, so um, there was basically a strong community campaign and engaging with ministers and uh, the planning system. Um, and I think the actual buyout took maybe three, two or, two or three years. But I think basically the group realized that the only way that they can see this space used and protected us the way they wanted it to be is if they owned it, um, because uh, there were no other, yeah, there were no other ways for for that to happen. Because you know, like the question of development would come up every every so often, so they just took it upon themselves and um, yeah, bought bought that bought that estate, and now it's kind of the green lung of the community. Um, they also refer to, so it's between M8 and M another motorway, and obviously it's um, it's a very it's a very interesting space. I recommend visiting if you're in the local area. Carrie, did you have anything on that at all, or or maybe the Glasgow Open Space strategy? Um, yeah, on the Glasgow Open Space, I haven't looked at that yet, but we'd be keen to. We've just started mm -hmm. um, contacting. Um, officers um, and councillors um, in terms of the soft launch for the hub. Um, so yeah, it's a great time to bring that up. There's a question about the legislation as well. 
is it still cumbersome? I, I could answer that very easily and say yes. <laughs> um, but that's why land reform is an ongoing process. Um, it's, there's much to be done. Um, and in urban areas, I think it seems to be widely agreed that it really isn't working very well at all. Um, but it can be fixed. And the majority of, I think, um, community buyouts, my understanding is that they're negotiated purchase. So even though the legislation doesn't quite work as well as it could. It's what's happened is it's changed people's understandings of what they can do and how landowners think about what they should be doing with their land. And it ultimately they are coming into legal agreements to just sell directly to community groups most commonly. Yeah, great, great. Um, Christina, I know that you've um, you've spoken before and, and I think visited like examples of this this kind of work down in Bristol as well. Um, it's just present in my mind because a couple of my friends have actually got plots um, on a, a Bristol Community Land Trust site um, for self-finished housing. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there's, there's different cases north and south of the border in terms of housing need. Um, do you see that as something that could apply to cities in Scotland where there's maybe vacant sites or gap sites and how does you're talking about sort of things coming from the community. Does it also come the other way? You know, if a council was saying, right, we need to think about how to meet this need, does it work the other way where they approach um, communities and things? Mm. Um, it's it's all very early stages in, uh, I guess, urban land reform. And uh, I would say so far it's been the, com well, it's the community deciding what assets and land they need and how they want them developed. Um, but I, I think the English example is really interesting because their community land trust, those community land trusts are basically all to do with developing housing because the policy driver in England is, um, yeah, yeah. is housing. So, I mean, it's really fascinating to them that when we talk about community land trusts, we, we talk about, you know, space boards or community shops and things like this, mm -hmm. because for them, like community land trust just means land for building housing, uh, community-led housing. But to us, it's fascinating that over here that, that we don't really have that many kind of aspirations for developing housing. Uh, Midstipo Quarter is a good example to the contrary because they want to repopulate their town center and build mm -hmm. develop mixed use developments in their high street. Um, but I mean, I think, I think it's really inspirational um, yeah. the community -led housing yeah. movement and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see more yeah. um, such projects but again you know but that's part of the process as well and now at one point do, do, does a community that might need housing is all actually confident that they can lead on such a development and you know assemble the sites and secure the finance for such such an ambitious project and I think this is what you know, we hope to support with the hub that, you know, groups with really ambitious vision like that could yep. come and kind of, you know, we can pilot some some projects like that. Um, but at the moment, maybe it's kind of the projects that are already in the pipeline or, you know, the, the, the easy wins maybe in some way. Yeah. Um, but I think anything is possible. <laughs> and I hope we do see community-led housing in, in yeah. urban areas in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. So Kerry, with the with the hub, um, that'll almost be like a one stop shop for that community and raising awareness. Yes, that's, and that's how it's going to people into professions, I suppose, as well. And mm -hmm. obviously, yeah. there's yeah. Uh, maybe we should talk about the technical support side of mm. the hub as well, Kerry. Do you want to pick up on um, in terms of, of the <laughs> setting up the, fr the framework? So yeah, one stop shop. So anyone with a question about community ownership would, would be able to approach the hub and, and be pointed in, in the right direction. Um, and in terms of, of the technical support framework, um, there's there's some gaps in the support services that, um, that community groups need when they're taking forward projects. Because the projects are so different, you'll appreciate that the support service they need is so different. Um, but some of the gaps we've identified sort of headlines are um, early stage engagement, so creative engagement being, being a key element early on. Um, that's where the mid steeple court example is great because they had that creative engagement from the stove. Um, and I'm wondering how else we can facilitate that type of, of innovative engagement in, in the hub area. Um, and then 
um, there's other gaps, particularly after um, that's the early community ownership. Another key issue is at the end. So once communities have taken ownership of their building and suddenly they have to deal with all sorts of other things like construction crews and business plans and staff, uh, managing staff, a lot of our members um, deal with that on an ongoing basis. So it's connecting those dots. Um, there's also lots of, of challenges around land ownership because it's, it's hard points. So, um, the community group says is how do I find out who owns that? So obviously there needs to be technical expertise around that. So there's lots of little pieces and what the hub is going to do is, is pull it all together and um, provide a, a platform for community groups to be, have some, to you know, <laughs> we need to work through the details of how it's going to work, but we want to make sure that the, that the expertise that community groups are appointing is, is appropriate for what they need. Um, which is also and important. one major area is also the planning engaging with the planning system. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? <laughs> the obvious one I've forgotten. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, we've spoken about sort of um, we've had members speak about the charrette process before, um, where you know you're creating a vision with a community and with various stakeholders and actors, etc., and uh, a lot of a lot of the work within that is also involved in the handover and in making those things happen. So it sounds like, you know, one, like you were mentioning, once a community has got a building, there's, it doesn't mean they don't necessarily still, you know, they still need support and then they might be dealing with other things. So there, I think there's similarities um, there, which is quite interesting. Um, Absolutely. And you, and from my background, we're here. To, oh. I'm just going to connect the dot about engagement and ch charrettes. What's exciting about community ownership is you can do all that with that great engagement work, but then um, community ownership allows the, the community to take ownership. It might yeah, take some yeah, time, but yeah. ultimately take ownership of the land and implement that engagement because engagement practitioners yeah. struggle with outputs. That's one of the key points. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, Andrew's asked a, a, a question there about um, whether it requi requires a willing buyer and a willing seller. Um, no. <laughs> no, it doesn't. So, well, there's a number of different routes into community ownership. So um, asset transfer, if groups want to acquire publicly owned assets, so there's a, um, there is a set process for that. And the, for example, a local authority has to engage with the request and follow due process and respond um, respond to the request basically. And I guess the argument is they might not be willing, but if the group makes strong enough um, uh, yeah, case for that, that they, they really should consider that and um, sell the asset. But when we're talking to about private owners, so the community right to buy, there's a numerous, numerous types of community right to buy. Uh, including abandoned and neglected land and, uh, and sustainable development. But um, the first community right to buy that came out a few years ago. So that's the one that basically is a preemptive right to buy. So you don't have to have a willing seller, but it, even if the group registers interest in the land through a process uh, set up by Scottish government, they their right only becomes triggered once the seller puts the land or building on the open market. So it doesn't, so the community wanting to buy an asset doesn't trigger its sale. So um, <laughs> that's complicated. So in, in a way, you know, they, you can register an interest in any land or building, but you a community can only buy it if and when it's put on the open market. So, um, so usually community right to buy is used as a bit of a negotiation tool for communities that want to buy, buy land because you know, they can say, we'd like to negotiate with you, come to the table, discuss with us, or we will, or and we will register interest through the community right to buy, which would mean that whenever you might decide to sell, we will have first, first refusal on this. But again, then that's, then there's a matter of technicality around fundraising for the actual purchase and so forth. For example, if it's 20 years from the time um, community registered interest and they have to renew it every five years. It is very technical and complicated, but no, it doesn't need a willing seller. <laughs> so 
so oh they... no that's all right no, it's a bit of freezing there let's see if it catches up with itself you're all frozen ah no you're moving again it's like um i feel like you could play like a really good game of musical squares on zoom where you play something and then you've all got to <laughs> has anyone done that yet you've been doing a lot of zoom rachel haven't you <laughs> It'll feature in the next coffee break or the next conference that I'm involved in. There'll be a section where we like just do that. <laughs> See, um, I did have a question and I've forgotten it because of that. Um, sorry. Does anyone else have a question whilst I get my uh, head back together in the squares? <laughs> Um, let me just check in the list as well. Um, oh, I wanted to draw your attention actually um, to, because Derek Irving was here earlier and he's involved, um, well, with the Green Action Trust um, and also on the Vacant and Derelict Land Task Force, um, gave us a very interesting talk a few weeks ago about Vacant and Derelict Land. Um, but he had to go because obviously the, there was a bit of a Zoom uh, clash. Um, but he's just noted that um, the CSGN or Green Action Trust as it is now supported the view park process and would be keen to do much more. Um, and he's noted that he sees community ownership as part of a continuum with community management and decision making. Um, so I can make sure that I put you in contact um, with him. If you're not already in contact, I mean, I imagine, you know, everyone knows everybody in this in these circles. So um, that, that one connection hasn't yet been being made oh, so okay. an introduction would be great and yeah i'm talking to another group in in their area as well that yeah. i think are going through a process as well so that's yeah. really positive that's really good that's so that's a yeah another good thing to come out of the coffee break um yeah so if anyone has any questions let me just check i've lost my i lost my thread slightly <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, you know, if if any questions pop up down the line, just feel free to to get in touch with us at Community Land Scotland, and we'll direct right. your question to whoever is best placed to. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, ah, I've remembered. I've remembered what it was because you said the word community. Um, so how? So I know you did mention it in the the presentation at the beginning, but how are you defining community? You know, is it does, is it a constituted group? Is it a group of people? You know, how would how does that work? I suppose. Yeah. So um, I guess it's a community organization, right? Uh, but in the community, so it can be a charitable organization, a SCIO, community benefit society. Um, so different legal structures. But what is what is what um, is kind of the key criteria for a group to be able to become a community land owner, access Scottish Land Fund, and use the community right to buy, um, is that they need to have uh, in their constitutional legal document framework, they need to have set out what geographic area their organization represents. So it could be, you know, a village of 100 people that want to buy a, a nearby estate because it's, you know, it's lying around and you know not doing anything is actually causing damage to their economic development or it could be an area in an urban in an urban context for example action party in edinburgh they used the community right to buy and their geographic area was actually five well, roughly five thousand people so they chose like different postcode areas to define their community and the idea is that um, you know, this organization represents people on in, in this kind of little pocket of Edinburgh and anyone who lives within the boundaries uh, can become a member and can have a voice and take part in the decision making. Usually these organizations have like a board or a steering group that, you know, are the people who are driving things, but um, the community landowners often like do community engagement constantly, every decision that they take, they go out to consult their local area, you know, their geographic area. So um, I think Scottish Land Commission featured some, some of our members, for example, the Golson Estate in Lewis, in terms of good practice uh, when, you know, uh, as a landowner, what, what does good practice look like? So they gave, you know, one of the 
good examples of good practice was actually a community landowner because of that kind of consult, not consultation, but you know, that embedded engagement and that democratic nature of the organization. Great. So, um, but then there is also an interesting one because in Dumfries, I'm interested that you already are going to hear from them, but they've chosen to rep, you know, their geographic area basically covers 30,000 people, which, um, you know, the principle of the Dumfries High Street belongs to everyone in Dumfries. Mm -hmm. But then if they're trying to use uh, specific routes into ownership, like community right by, Mm -hmm. then that doesn't really work for them because they have to basically get more than 15,000 people to, to engage in a like in a vote yeah, yeah which would be higher than i guess the participation in elections or something like that so yeah, often yeah. when groups set up their geographic remit and they have in mind what route into ownership they would take they kind of choose <laughs> choose accordingly be because of kind of technicalities but the thing is everyone benefits from the development even if the decision you know if, even if the decision about ownership and development is made by a smaller you know a geographic area then you know them everyone in Dumfries and Dumfries and Galway would benefit from having yeah yeah, absolutely. A, a town street, a, a high street like that, or you know, everyone in the central belt will benefit from having View Park as a green space. So um, it just the decision is made is made locally and kept locally. The power resides with that community. Right. right. Yeah. Now, um, thank you. You've given us a lot of um, food for thought, um, and I will I'll retweet a link to your event. Is it on the twelfth? I'll retweet a link to that. That's right. Yeah. And yeah, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, thanks to our speakers and hope you have a good couple of weeks.